Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker. She was violated at the age of six months to 17 years old by all immediate family members and assorted others during that period. Today, the term is trafficking, but back then, there was no place to run for help or safety. Her desire for justice led to law school, but she realized justice is less about law and more about action. Andy Berger is an international speaker, corporate trainer, educator, business owner, writer, media talent, public relations and marketing consultant, nonprofit executive and community ambassador. Born in Inglewood, California, Andy graduated Marywood High School in 1980. She then received her bachelor's degree in business administration with minors in communication and economics from Loyola Marymount in 1983. In 1988, she completed her law degree from Western State University College of Law. Here to tell her story about being trafficked and her story of co-founding Beulah's Place to help at-risk homeless teens who have been victimized and discarded to die on the streets is Andy Berger. Andy, welcome to Revealing the Truth. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here, truly. Andy, uh, this is a story about faith. And although in the bio faith is not mentioned, faith is what this was all about. And, Absolutely. And, that, and this faith journey was more than your journey through trafficking. Your faith journey was more than all these accomplishments and credentials although your experiences may have caused you maybe to uh, want to go the extra 10 miles past where everybody else would go because you had a personal passion for this. Take us first through your faith journey and then we'll talk about uh, the years of being trafficked. Sure. I was very young and occasionally the same people that violated me would take us to church, my birth brother and I. But really, uh, it came down to age five. My birth mother said my days were numbered. She had already tried to end my life before. And at that particular moment, the abuse physically, sexually, otherwise was so bad. I went out to the curb of our house and I waited for a car to be coming by fast enough to jump in front of. So at five, it was my first attempt at suicide, and that's kind of where God actually met me. I remember that that normally busy street had absolutely no car coming that afternoon. And as I waited and waited, I looked up into the big blue sky. I was just a little girl, and I thought, wow, somebody must have made this big sky. There has to be something or someone bigger than the people that are hurting me, than the life I have, but at that time, being six feet under sounded a lot better than being able to stay in that house. So I heard this gentle voice in my heart saying, this is not the way. Um, I have a plan for you. And for whatever reason, as I looked into the sky, I believed it. And so when I went back up the hill to the garage, I remember leaning against the garage saying, if you keep me alive, I will do whatever you call me to do. Now, how a five-year-old would have that understanding, I don't know, but God was merciful enough to give that to me. Of course, the years didn't exactly work out as well as I thought they would, and 18 was a long ways away from five, but uh, as I went through the difficulties that I did, God always showed himself either in a stranger or a teacher or some kind of momentary break from the chaos and the ugliness and the evil in the house. I did try a couple more times to end my life because things were so bad it escalated um, as I got into what would be middle school now and in the preteens. But at one point, uh, I realized that I either had to live fully and trust that God really had my back and had my heart, or I had to end it completely. And I'd already gone through so much pain, so when I prayed, I was 16, I said, okay, I am not going to do this anymore. I'm going to live, and I'm going to trust that you have a purpose for my life, Lord. And that's what I did. I just leaned into him with very, very childlike faith. Um, I didn't really have an experiential knowledge of his love. It was very intellectual. But that's what I had, and that's what I clung to. And in one moment, he showed me, a little bit of what that heart was. 
I went to church and there was this woman and she was radiant. She just glowed from head to toe, blonde hair, blue eyes, beautiful smile. She was talking to a gentleman about how much Jesus loved children. And I thought, well, I'm kind of a child. Maybe he loves me too. And I want to be like that woman. I want to radiate. I want to glow. And if that's how happy she is, then that's what I want. And so that's really what the basis was. Very childlike faith. Even today I have a very childlike faith, but much more uh, intimate with the Lord. Andy, in your opening comments, you said the same people who were sexually abusing you were the same ones that took you to church. Yes. And I know that doesn't sit well with a lot of people, but that's the truth. Well, it actually is more common than most people know. Yes. And uh, we're seeing these exposés now come out, these investigations now going on in 20 cities, major cities where the Archdiocese is headquartered in 20 major cities. And sexual sin uh, is rampant. Trafficking is something that's such an atrocity that uh, having been the victim of human trafficking within your own family and whoever else they decided to um, peddle you to, uh, they felt perfectly comfortable in doing so. Uh, how did this impact your relationship with them when you came to a knowledge of faith and a realization of how violated you were being? That's a complicated question, but I'll do my best to, to express. They never did come to the acceptance that anything had happened in our home. And back then, because I was born in 62, there you didn't tell anybody, there weren't places to go, and you definitely didn't speak about it, even to family members. We were moved a lot, because I think once my birth mother got comfortable or people started to know her, we had to move. Uh, because then they might find out the cycle. And when she became a teacher, it was even more evident that she could be found out. So to go back to the question, uh, I never really resolved with the perpetrators in my life. I went to counseling uh, way late in my early 30s, and that's kind of where I began to express all the things that had happened. So my cover was to be that overachiever, the peacemaker, the driven person, so that nobody got too close to me. And then if I had to be seen with them, because I didn't move out until I was probably 20, just before law school, I didn't know I could be free mentally and emotionally. All the bad self-talk kept me trapped. But as God and I grew together, so to speak, um, I got more courageous and I went to college, finished early, went to law school, again, trying to find that place where I fit and where I could shine and maybe not feel so bad about myself. Andy, does you have siblings? I do. I, I have one birth brother who is not in contact with me ever since he acknowledged that we had been abused and that was probably 15, 16 years ago. He does not want to be contacted or found. He is very much a loner and did not get the good God that I got. He sees him as a very punitive God. As you began to go through counseling and address both your drive for excellence, your drive for accomplishment to compensate for the degradation that you had suffered, that the extreme end of abuse to overachieving that, that uh, delta between the two are, is great. And it's natural that you would want to do that. You either wallow in defeat and never climb out of it, or you run as fast as you can, as high as you possibly can, until you no longer can run, because you can't outrun the problem, whatever you had in the past, you always carry with you until you cut the tie to it. How were you able to cut those ties to where you could emotionally be connected? Uh, did you find marriage? Did you find family? Did you find that uh, your satisfaction was only in your career? Great questions. Uh, first of all, I did work on the forgiveness part, which people are always amazed at. But here's the thing. 
if you hold on to something and you never let it go, I don't believe that you can be open to God's blessings. And I had to work very, very hard. Each of the perpetrators, the Lord and I would take long walks. I would be, ah, oh, no way, I'm not doing it. If you want me to forgive them, you have to do it through me because there's no way. I don't, I don't ever want to be associated with these people. So the Lord had to work on my heart. And in a matter of maybe three or four days, I would be able to release and relinquish what I wanted and allowed God to do what he needed and wanted to do in my life. Because forgiveness, as you know, is not for the other person. It's for you. And if I kept all that bitterness, anger, ugliness inside, who knows, I might have ended up with cancer, become a prostitute or something else that was not God's way for me. So each of them I did end up forgiving. Uh, my birth father had a massive heart attack and I was told about it. And I actually went to see him in the hospital. He couldn't talk, but I looked at him and I said, I forgive you. Not because I wanted to go and say that, but because the Lord asked me to. And I felt that I had been so blessed at that point that that was the least I could do in love for God, not in love for the birth father or any of that stuff. But I also did marry uh, somebody that was not good for me. Uh, that's also a natural course of, of abuse victims. Sometimes we choose poor partners, and I did. But in that process, that's where I went to counseling for three years. And I had a great counselor who helped me get all the identities out kind of uh, work through the way to communicate, how to get my needs met, what I wanted. And I knew that I would never have married that man if I had known what I had known through counseling. God was gracious enough to allow me to be delivered from that abusive marriage. It was very dark, very abusive, very controlling, classic narcissist, all the things that were not good for me. But in his grace and mercy, Year, a couple years after the divorce, he brought the most amazing human I've ever met. And that is my husband of 19 years today. So out of uh, what the enemy meant for evil, God worked for his good. Absolutely. Even when we can't see God working, he always is. He loves his children. But sometimes we feel pretty dirty inside or shamed, and we don't believe that he could love something that smells like yesterday gar yesterday's garbage, which is what I felt like even though I had success and I had the outside things, the image of being okay. Andy, as you look back on this and you look at the impact it had on you, uh, you exhibited the behaviors of overachievement, but when it came to self-esteem, self-worth, those kind of things, your definition of who you were was not uh, a godly definition. It was a worldly yeah. definition. That's correct. I would look at myself and see all the flaws, everything that was wrong with me. And because of ha what happened in my life, I would never wear anything that flattered my figure. I would never give anybody any reason to look at me. And that took... Uh, God and I a long time, and eventually, as I understood his image and what I should be, I could look in the mirror day to day and say, you know, you're not perfect, you've got a lot of stuff to work on, but today you're okay. And so that's one of the exercises I try and help others with, because you have to see the God in you, otherwise we would be hateful creatures. We would never shine for him. How large... Uh, and, and I want you to use this uh, uh, maybe 10 minutes to really give us a hard education on human trafficking. Uh, okay. a, a, as much information as you possibly can pour into this period of time, statistics, uh, how rampant it is, how insidious it is, how it's often family, uh, people, you know, you're, you're uh, 10 years younger than me. Uh, there was never any discussion whatsoever of anything. I, was, uh, I, I wouldn't have ever known if one of my uh, siblings or neighbors or anyone, this was just not anything that was, was discussed in the world, uh, but yet it was still going on at that time. 
so yeah. help us understand the magnitude of sex trafficking and the violation of children and the predatory nature of those that take advantage of children. Okay. I am not a statistician, but I will give you what I do know. Right now, um, sex trafficking, child trafficking, human trafficking, that whole ball of wax is the second largest illegal enterprise in the United States today. Probably number one in the world, but I'm, I don't know about the drug trade, so I'm, I can't speak to that, but in the U.S. And here's the thing, just as we talked about earlier, it happens in churches. And what happens? Churches re relocate the predators, and they will repeat the behavior elsewhere. And it happens in schools. We know that. It happens everywhere. However, the overall national awareness is not where it needs to be because there's still a lot of places where, well, that can't happen here. I know, you know, little Joey's parents or whoever, they're, they're not understanding that a child snatched. We have 48 hours before a child that's on the street or a teen that's on the street will be taken up into trafficking or approached for trafficking purposes. And depending on the part of the country you're in, where I live, there is not a 7-Eleven on every corner. There's not a way to get food readily all the time. So you get hungry, you get cold, and as a young person, you'll take whatever comes your way. So trafficking happens for greed and perversion. In my case, it was strictly perversion. I don't know if they even knew they could make money off of that back then. But at this point in our nation, it's all about the money and the power. And here's the thing, drugs, if somebody has to traffic drugs, you have to make the drug, you have to package it, you have to get, there's a lot of process where you can get arrested or caught doing that. But let's say you take your girlfriend to a party where six of your friends are, and you pass her around for money, there's not really a way to get caught, and generally the girl is too ashamed to show up. Here's what I know. Somebody's been truly victimized. At some point, they come forth and they speak unless they're intimidated, terrorized, or somebody forces them into lying, which is, is very often. But as an example, even on college campuses, a friend of mine who's an ex-Navy SEAL who works with a lot of anti-trafficking organizations, he told me a story where they actually will pay young men $1,500 sometimes, maybe more, to target a girl, maybe the one that's a little shyer or is disenfranchised from the popular kids or, you know, something like that. He gets to know her, maybe takes her out for a Coke or something, earns her trust temporarily. And then the next day or the next night, he takes her someplace where there are more boys and the girl never returns back the same way she left. Okay. With some of the kids that we work with, same thing. One of our girls, she was taken away from her mother at two and a half because the mother sexually violated her. Given to a father who didn't want the child, he beats her up. And so when she begins to run away, she's constantly returned back to the same people that are abusing her, and it's a terrible cycle. So the predators, as you mentioned, a couple of years ago, the common profile was a white male, 35 to 45 years old, with a family living in a gated community. Well, that age has dropped significantly down to like the 25 to 35 year old range. It is easier to sell our children in this country than it is to do anything else. The disenfranchised kids, whether it's, it used to be, well, if you have two parents working, they were latchkey. But that's not really it anymore. It's just a lack of, of being involved, a lack of supervision, a lack of community where we watch out for the kids that are walking alone on the street or to school. And then if we don't vet out the schools or the administration of the people that watch our kids, I was forced into piano lessons, but nobody checked out the, the, the husband of the piano teacher, right? So that doesn't work very well for a young person. Even when I went to college and I had a professor who approached me for extra credit, what I could do to earn extra credit in accounting, I tried to assert myself and I called the dean of the business school and he laughed at me. He said, there is no way that professor would ever do that. He was just joking. That's not what the other girl said and that's definitely not what I knew. So then again, authority 
pushed me back into a timid state of, well, then just don't say anything. Don't speak up. Just put your head down, do what you got to do, and keep moving, right? A lot of these kids, they don't get the chance to keep moving. So the predators, they're everywhere, but that doesn't mean we can't fight it. One of the things we need to do is not protect the abusers, not protect any institution that allows that. There has got to be a unified nation against this one issue. There's no party affiliation involved in human rights, but we don't even uphold the Constitution for the rights of those we lose every day. Right now, we lose five kids a day just to child abuse. That's not even trafficking. So we're killing our kids, and we're selling them. And what we're doing is selling our future down the hole for the whole country when we do not protect these um, vulnerable people. Andy, why do you think that this is not, if it's the second largest revenue source, illegal revenue source in the nation, and the consumer, and, and, and I may answer my own question when I define the consumer, uh, is Christian, is a churchgoer, is an upstanding member of the community, but uh, availing themselves of prostitutes and availing themselves of children, it seems that pedophilia, uh, child pornography, uh, the number of people who are being implicated in these uh, atrocious areas, these abominable areas, uh, it's, it, it seems like this is, you know, the, the top line news are talking about immigration. Mm -hmm. um, you know, protecting our borders from 10,000 people when hundreds of thousands of children are being trafficked. Uh, we're talking about abortion which we should be talking about because it's the leading mm -hmm. cause of preventable death in America. But the protection for our children in this human sex trafficking, and once you've been trafficked, once you're under the covering of a trafficker, your opportunity for escape is virtually impossible. The truck stops, the motels, the organized crime that exists within uh, drugs and intimidation that keep children uh, who started as a child, they were kidnapped or they were run away, they were picked up off the street, they were introduced to drugs, they were then introduced to a, uh, 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 a pimp or somebody who was, was, they became their property. They then had to perform or be beaten. Uh, they were afraid for their lives. There, there are many uh, organizations now that are going out into these communities and trying to reach uh, these young traffic. And it's as many boys as it is girls and we're completely unaware of the magnitude of this problem. And it is something that it's almost that education is falling on deaf ears. You could say that, yes, definitely, and here's part of the issue. Somebody always knows what is happening in that house, okay? There's always somebody who knows, but they're not willing or don't have the courage to step forward and say that's wrong. They don't want to upset the family. They don't want to look bad. They don't want to have the shame of that happening. Um, hanging over their family so everybody for generations sometimes will remain silent instead of getting the help they need and a long time ago even in churches going to counseling professional counseling was seen as taboo well God will take care of it you know if you have a problem you know go to Jesus which is true however there are things that we have to do as human beings and so whether it's church counseling professional counseling victims need to reach out and get that help we are a country that has such a ripe, fertile ground for predators because one, we don't adhere to our own laws about pedophiles. In some areas, you can be tagged for a DUI and have your name all over the paper, but yet you can be a pedophile living right across the street from a school. How is that possible? Why does that happen? We're not united on this issue. There's a lot of money, like you said, going for other causes, but America should be most concerned about its most precious source of energy, and that's its children, its youth. 
and the fact that we're using humans against what the Constitution set up. You know, where's the rights of the, the children that die? Where are the rights of the children that are taken from their families forever? And because there really isn't that structure, that moral structure, or even a solid legal structure where we will go after those predators full force. Not even people in jail like child predators, okay? So they, they have their own strange moral compass, but even they know you don't touch children. But yet on the outside, go for it. And I do know even, uh, so we're, I'm in Central Oregon, but in Portland, we have other cultures coming to our area to find, find new product, so to speak. We don't close down the ports. We don't check things if, uh, like you said, a lot of kids are trucked or they're, they're taken over state line faster than you can, than you can think. Uh, one gal was taken to a Target store. Uh, she was bought a Coke by her new boyfriend, you know, 16, 17-year-old kid. He suddenly isn't feeling well, says, oh, I'll get my friends to take you home. She's kind of stuck. She doesn't want to call mom and say, hey, I kind of left school and I went out with this guy, Right. So they take her over state line within 45 minutes and gang raped her. Now the mom had sewn a cell phone or a GPS tracker somehow into the backpack, which is the only reason they found that girl alive, but definitely not the same girl that left that day. So without parents, the parents that send kids overseas, I would be terrified to send a teenager, even if it's for graduation, overseas. I'm terrified for the kids that are still here, the teenagers that walk home or that go to parties and they don't understand the dangers. Unfortunately, unless we get everybody on deck and do like you're doing, you're getting the message out there, hey, this does happen, even in a small town, especially in a small town because people trust each other more. In the bigger cities, you just get lost and the kids will just go wherever they have to. We're talking with Andy Berger victim of sexual assault for most of her uh, life until she was in her late teens, until she finally was able to leave home and enter into the educational system where she then really at age 30 began to address what had happened to her. She was accomplished, she had excelled in academia, she would excelled in business, but by all the world's measures, she was a well-accomplished, stable, incorruptible individual, but yet uh, she had this horrendous experience of years, over a decade of sexual abuse by family members and family member friends. Her story, as appalling as it is, is ordinary. It's not extraordinary. It is more common than any of us want to believe that it's happening right under our eyes, in our churches, in our businesses, in our truck stops, in our motels, in our homes, in our churches, in every kind of environment, in our classrooms, in our schools. Our ability to recognize this as the second leading revenue source in the United States, illegal revenue source in the United States, is something that is eluding legislation, eluding Congress, and eluding the media. And it's time to put a stop to the ostrich attitude of burying our heads in the sand and not bubbling this up to being one, the nation's, one of the nation's most important issues. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back with Andy, we're going to talk about Beulah's Place, which is something that she's done and created a nonprofit organization providing temporary shelters for at risk homeless teen boys and girls. But what we as a nation, and what the clarion call is for our nation to get to our legislators, both in our state houses and in our federal houses of representatives and legislation to enact laws which are going to be enforced by law enforcement not like this liberal policy of whether or not somebody can form a sanctuary city because of illegal immigration. This is something that violates the child and changes the child forever. Uh, Andy is a praise report to the restorative power of God, but she is the exception, not the rule. 
the average trafficked young woman finds herself addicted to drugs, winds up either in jail or winds up dead. And this could happen to your daughter or your son unless we speak out and do something about it. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we'll rejoin Andy Berger of Beulah House. We'll be right back. Shalom. I'm the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and I've got a question for you. What do you think they're doing with your DNA? Oh, you know that 23andMe kit that you sent off and you got back that report that told you you were Irish, you were French, you were Jewish? Wonder who's interested in that information? It's not like you've sent it off to a database with millions of other people and they can steal your identity. And who would really be interested in that information other than you? Well, maybe your friends and family, but there's one, yes, one, who is so interested in your DNA that it would be something that would make you afraid. And that is Satan himself. Why would Satan be interested in your DNA? Because there is a Y chromosome marker that determines whether or not you are in the line of Aaron. That's right, the biblical line of Aaron the priest. That's because if the priesthood comes back and the high priest takes his role as the head of the Sanhedrin, they will be the ones to call for the return of Jesus. Well, what can they do with your DNA? Well, there are 40-plus countries weaponizing DNA today. And imagine if Satan could weaponize your DNA and use that Y chromosome market to take out the line of the high priest, then Jesus doesn't come back. That is the plot behind the best-selling book, The Codus, now out in second edition, on Kindle, $2.99, also available in paperback. This is a biblical thriller beyond comparison that's going to take you on an incredible journey to understand what they could do with your DNA. I also want to encourage you to visit our website, ignitingandnation.com, and click on Special Offers. There you're going to find the yellow cover of this book, The Seven Laws of Abundant Living, Lessons Learned from the Tree of Life. We're going to take you on a journey in the Garden of Eden to the seed, the ground, all the way out to the fruit that reveals things of the natural that God is trying to reveal supernatural truths. Contained within these pages are seven laws and seven lessons within each law. They're going to take you on an incredible journey of understanding about the life you live and the fruit you bear. I want to encourage you to click on that yellow cover. We're going to ask for your email. Now, we won't send you spam because spam is not kosher, but we will send you the first chapter of this book. I want to encourage you to get Seven Laws of Abundant Living Lessons Learned from the Tree of Life. You can get it on Amazon. You can get it on Barnes & Noble. You can get it Books A Million, wherever great Christian books are sold. Take this journey with me to the Tree of Life in the Garden of Eden and to the Tree of Life we see again at the River of Life. Get your copy today. Shalom. I'm the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and I've got a question for you. What do you think they're doing with your DNA? Oh, you know that 23andMe kit that you sent off and you got back that report that told you you were Irish, you were French, you were Jewish? Wonder who's interested in that information. It's not like you've sent it off to a database with millions of other people and they can steal your identity. And who would really be interested in that information other than you? Well, maybe your friends and family, but there's one, yes, one who is so interested in your DNA that it would be something that would make you afraid. And that is Satan himself. Why would Satan be interested in your DNA? Because there is a Y chromosome marker that determines whether or not you are in the line of Aaron. That's right, the biblical line of Aaron the priest. That's because if the priesthood comes back and the high priest takes his role as the head of the Sanhedrin, they will be the ones to call for the return of Jesus. Well, what can they do with your DNA? Well, there are 40-plus countries weaponizing DNA today. And imagine if Satan could weaponize your DNA and use that Y chromosome market to take out the line of the high priest, then Jesus doesn't come back. That is the plot behind the best-selling book, The Codus, now out in second edition, on Kindle, $2.99, also available in paperback. This is a biblical thriller beyond comparison that's going to take you on an incredible journey to understand what they could do with your DNA. I also want to encourage you to visit our website, ignitingandnation.com, and click on Special Offers. There you're going to find the yellow cover of this book, The Seven Laws of Abundant Living, Lessons Learned from the Tree of Life. We're going to take you on a journey in the Garden of Eden to the 
seed, the ground, all the way out to the fruit that reveals things of the natural that God is trying to reveal supernatural truths. Contained within these pages are seven laws and seven lessons within each law. They're going to take you on an incredible journey of understanding about the life you live and the fruit you bear. I want to encourage you to click on that yellow cover. We're going to ask for your email. Now, we won't send you spam because spam is not kosher, but we will send you the first chapter of this book. I want to encourage you to get Seven Laws of Abundant Living Lessons Learned from the Tree of Life. You can get it on Amazon. You can get it on Barnes & Noble. You can get it Books A Million, wherever great Christian books are sold. Take this journey with me to the Tree of Life in the Garden of Eden and to the Tree of Life we see again at the River of Life. Get your copy today. Shalom and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and we're talking to Andy Berger, co-founder of Vula's House, a home for young, uh, troubled, and in danger uh, teenagers, and uh, someone who was sexually, sexually trafficked as a child and as a young adult. Andy, welcome back to the program. Thank you. Andy, you. when we open up, I ask about some uh, backgrounds and statistics. I want to read this to you so we can see how large a problem this is. And we tend to think that um, uh, human trafficking is only sexual. It is, it is uh, as much forced labor as it is sexual. So although slavery, and I'm taking this from polarisproject.org, Although slavery is common thought to be a thing of the past, human traffickers generate hundreds of billions of dollars in profits by trapping millions of people in horrific situations around the world, including here in the United States. Traffickers use violence, threats, deception, debt bondage, and other manipulative tactics to force people to engage in commercial sex or to provide labor or services against their will. While more research is needed on the scope of human trafficking, below are a few key statistics. The International Labor Organization estimates that there are 40.3 million victims of human trafficking globally. 81% of them are trapped in forced labor. 25% of them are children. 75% of them are women and girls. The International Labor Organization estimates that forced labor and human trafficking is a $150 billion industry worldwide. The U.S. Department of Labor has identified 148 goods from 75 countries made by forced and child labor. In 2017, an estimated one out of every seven endangered runaways reported to the National Center for Missing and Exploiting Children were likely child sex trafficking victims. Of those, 88% were in the care of social services or foster care when they ran. There is no estimate of the total number of human trafficking victims in the United States. Polaris estimates that the total number of victims nationally reaches into the hundreds of thousands when estimates of both adults and minors and sex trafficking and labor trafficking are aggregated. There are more than 49,000 cases of human trafficking reported to the hotline in the last 10 years. The hotline receives multiple reports of human trafficking in each of the 50 states. The number of trafficking cases learned about the United States increases every year. 24% of texting conversations on the Polaris Be Free text line were from survivors of human trafficking, and the hotline receives over 150 calls a day. You can check out uh, their ministry as well as Beulah's House. Uh, and Beulah's house is at Beulah's place, I'm sorry, Beulah's place dot org or polarisproject.org to find out the facts. And when you look at this map of the hot spots of human trafficking, uh, it is appalling that the United States is one solid block of dots of color, so much so that you would look at this like a weather map of tornadoes occurring in thousands of places simultaneously. It is appalling at how extensive this is. What can we do? It's definitely the most tragic 
situation I could ever think of, especially for a country like America that started out, that was birthed for a desire for freedom uh, from from tyranny and, and spiritual oppression, all those things. But the first thing we can do is wake up as a nation. The second thing is we need to decide to rally, to, to create our own media frenzy about the need for this to be all over uh, the news, the front page, all of that stuff. It may not be as sensational as the other things that are being thrown out there in a big smoke screen of misdirection, but this is a, a hideous representation of our, our values in our country. So the other part of it is, like Beulah's Place, my husband and I started it 10 years ago, and we knew we wanted to do something for the youth in our area, and there, there wasn't a lot out there. I had had uh, a major um, accident that had caused a traumatic brain injury, was not able to work, and so I wanted to do, I thought, Lord, what am I going to do, okay, in case I can't work the way I used to as a corporate trainer and all those other things. And when Ed and I talked about it, we were serving Thanksgiving dinner to homeless families at the senior center, and we saw a few girls come in that had just had babies, newborns. I don't think they were more than 17 or 18 years old, and they were living in their cars. They didn't have a place to go. Well, my husband and I have always worked with teens, you know, whether it was Sunday school or in the community, and we just decided, you know what, let's just step out in faith and put a little website up and explain our vision. For the community. Now our community is very, very tight and so I would always have to start with my story because it was a community that didn't accept that we had that problem either. Smaller communities it's a little tougher but eventually won their respect and trust and so we started Beulah's Place and about five years ago we started taking in our first Central Oregon teens. We had helped teens in other states but we rescued our first girl and we said, I'm not quite sure what we're doing yet, but we're going to figure it out. And God gave us the skills. He gave us resources. And the most important thing that we gave was love without judgment. No matter where, they, where this girl came from, what had happened, and she was running from an area three hours away from us. She came over the mountain looking for safety from a very abusive family and a bunch of dysfunction. So when she got here, we took her in. We loved her. She came to actually know God through us. And even though we're not a religious organization, we're a public nonprofit, 501c3. But she went to church and she found a place with God after being hurt by church people. So it took a long process. But after we took that first girl and we just kept taking him in. And our program's about three to five months when we house them. So Ed and I have had 16 of these kids in our house before, not at the same time, but we've, we've put them through and we've used other safe houses for the boys and the girls that we rescue. The boys are harder to come forward to say I've been hurt or I need something, but when they do, you know, we work with them and we make sure that they're okay as well. So loving without judgment and then figuring out what is their need. Do they need medical? Do they need safety? What can we do for them? And basically, like the Good Samaritan, we make sure that they have everything and that we prepare them for young adulthood. And how we do that is we require that they complete high school education and we require that they have a job within a week or two of coming to us, which we help facilitate. Because if you're homeless and you're dirty and you don't have a bank account, it's really hard to get a job. And when you don't feel good about yourself, it's hard to present well. So once they eat and they sleep and they're cleaned up and they have decent clothes and they've had time to decompress a little bit, then we get them ready for a job. And they have to maintain that job while they're with us. So of the 35 that uh, we've housed uh, over the last few years, five are in college, one started her own family, and we've got many others wanting to be part of the program, which is why we're in the process of buying a building that will help with that. But here's the other part of traffic victims, of those that survive but maybe run out of gas before they have a chance to really see God's purpose for them. We have a high suicide rate in the 14 to 19 year old range. And I know there's a lot of suicide among other populations, but for us, when they take their life, we can't help them, obviously. We can't, we can't figure out 
what we can do for them. And so we're hoping by expanding, we're going to have more opportunities to reach these kids that are confused, that are caught between either lifestyle or cultural differences because they've been disenfranchised from safe, viable family or extended family members. We kind of become that fill-in hub of safety and love for these kids. And if I could, I would adopt them all. Don't know where I would put them all, but I would adopt all of them. Because when you meet our kids, you would never know who slept in a park, who slept in a car, who had to get in a tree to sleep to protect herself you know, from other homeless men. You would not know who these kids were just a short time ago because they're amazing human beings and young adults. And my wish is that God allows us to be either the example or the way for more kids to have that opportunity, to, to have that purpose and to experience the life he desired for them the way he desired it for me. Andy, are there any national associations? Uh, you know, in most other areas you have uh, uh, a unified effort, lobbying efforts going on. It seems that as I look at um, uh, some of the reports that um, uh, there was established a National Human Trafficking Awareness Month, but um, it was just really an opportunity to get involved in volunteer projects, mm -hmm. but there was no central voice that represented uh, anti-human trafficking in America that began to police uh, truck stops or began to police motels or uh, began to sponsor legislation which would cause local law enforcement or others to get more actively involved in identifying these. And, and this is uh, yes, there are individual pockets, and that's easy to hide, but there are those that are running at the upper levels. There are these kingpins of, of human trafficking that do have organizations. And so, uh, you know, the RICO Act, uh, Organized Crime uh, Act, uh, does impact this particular area, uh, but it is not something where, at least in media that I see, that there is a voice, a singular voice, a national representative, a national outcry that's making the talk show circuit that is going around to every one of the networks and raising the awareness and camping out in Washington and walking into every senator's office and every congressman's office uh, with uh, a draft of a bill that they want passed to uh, make this something that is nationally aware. Now, that could exist, but I'm not aware of it. Are you? No, I am not aware of that coordinated voice, and that's exactly the point. We need to speak to all the nations, whether it's at the UN, we need the White House, we need everybody that is hugely visible with, with deep, deep uh, circles of influence to rally and to get on this track with us. One of the reasons I'm speaking throughout the East Coast and the country now and going to universities, um, as I'm requested, is, is to make the awareness and to see if we can't get the young younger population to get on board, to give them a cause and a purpose, but we need a ground swell. And, and you're right, we need that coordinated voice. We need kind of that hub that says, okay, everyone involved, instead of just celebrity A or celebrity B who kind of does something for anti-trafficking, everybody has their charity of choice. But in this case, there are, these kids have no choice. They need us to make the choice for them to say, stop it, you know, rescue me. I prayed that somebody would hear the screams or the terror that went on in our house, either that or that God would let me die. But the same God, you know, that I cried out to to die said, no, I want you to live. And that's what I want for these kids. I want our nation to say, we want you to live and we will do what it takes and set aside our differences, set aside everything we're arguing about right now so we can focus on protecting our children and making America as a whole a sanctuary for its citizens. You know, it's really quite interesting that uh, your divorce is just a statistic in so many broken marriages because 
of what you brought into the marriage was broken and you attracted, broken attracts broken. So what if we had something that we could look at and say can impact drug addiction, can impact teen suicide, can impact opioid use, could impact the divorce rate reduction in America, could impact mental health in America. And that one area that it all funnels down to is human trafficking is the epicenter of many of these branches and many of these symptoms that we're trying to deal with saying, oh, we have an opioid crisis. Well, could it be that it's not just prescription drugs, but it's these drug dealers that are using yeah. opioids to keep people engaged in sex trafficking? Uh, sure. Well, we have a crystal meth problem. Well, could it be the crystal meth is the drug of choice that drug traffickers or human sex traffickers are using to keep their girls or their young boys coming back for the next fix? Maybe it's the epicenter is human trafficking and it's not the drug crisis and it's not the divorce rate and it's not mental health issues that the epicenter happens to be something that's impacting in every city in America. And until it happens to your daughter or your son or to you individually, it doesn't seem like it's compelling enough a story for people to get involved. Yet right. if what you and I are saying is true, that sex trafficking or human trafficking, whether it's for labor or for sex, is the epicenter of much of this, then we should be dealing with the cause, not the symptoms. And should the church who at one point in time were the voice of America. Mm -hmm. uh, this was what the revolutionary uh, England was afraid of, was the black robe regiment that were the ones in the pulpit. Uh, yes. Does the pulpit need to be more vocal? Do we need be, to be more community minded? Do we need, need to have in this neighborhood watch, uh, does that need to be just more than a strange car or a break-in? Does it need to be hey, what's going on in the house next door? Why are the shades always pulled? Why is their child always walking to school with their head hung low? Why do they have no friends? What's going on in that place? And is social services so encumbered with the way it's been for the last 50 years that it has not changed with the times? Is this something that we need to get behind and legislate and get people on the front lines to deal with the core epicenter of all these other issues, mental health, divorce, drug addiction, drug abuse, suicide, all these issues wrapped up into one and say, could it be? I'm only asking the question, it's a question mark. We don't have the statistical data to, to, to back it up, but I'm sure that there are organizations that would agree that if we dealt with the epicenter of all of this, that we could have an impact on America that would change America forever. It absolutely would. And whether it's trafficking, abuse as a whole, all of that, you cannot, like you said, broken attracts broken. If somebody cannot get the help they need and they're already in, into their young adult years, they're going to anesthetize them or they're going to replicate where they came from. And when they have children, it's just going to continue generation after generation. We are blessed that we've had a chance to change 35 generations, but that's not nearly enough. Is it better than before? Sure. But we need everybody, like you said, to rally. Most of those issues you talked about would decrease dramatically if we dealt with the root. We've been talking with Andy Berger, outspoken, accomplished lawyer, uh, businesswoman and now uh, head of a nonprofit, Beulah's Place, uh, to help at risk homeless teams who have been victimized and discarded to die on the streets. Uh, this issue of human trafficking is a major issue, and it's time for America to wake up, for the church to wake up and say this is ungodly, it yes. is not in keeping with Judeo Christian values, and we need to put a stop to it. Andy Berger, thank you for being such an outspoken voice on such a very troubling and difficult subject. Thank you so much. God bless you, my friend. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we'll bring you the next edition of Revealing the Truth.